All right, chapter uh, 12 and really chapter 13, we're, we're combining, um, and it's all about solutions. We've talked about solids, we've talked about gases, now we're going to kind of uh, wrap up the three phases of matter that we study and talk about solutions. Now, uh, the process that solutions undergo is going to kind of help us understand how acids and bases work, so that's where we're set up to go. We're going to go to acids and bases next. Okay, so let's begin by talking about solutions by talking about the nature of a solution. Well, first of all, what the heck is a solution? You should remember from chapter two that a solution is a homogeneous mixture, meaning that it is uniform all the way throughout. <clears throat> and a solution has two parts a solute, which is the substance being dissolved. Typically, we think of a solute as a solid, though that's not always the case. And a solvent, which is the, uh, the substance that is doing the dissolving, um, the solvent is usually great present in greater amount and the solvent is typically we think of as a liquid though it doesn't always have to be that way. Okay, And I've got here an example of um, potassium permanganate in water and I'm actually going to show you this in class it, uh, of how this process works, of how it dissolves, how it spreads throughout. Um, but our solute is the potassium permanganate and the solvent is going to be our water. And I'll show you this in class so you kind of get, uh, so you understand what's happening here. Okay, let's talk about types of mixtures. Okay, we have several different types of mixtures that we can talk about in terms of a uh, solution. Um, remember, a solution is a homogeneous mixture. Solutions can exist as gases, liquids, or solids. Um, I have an example I have right here is I've got sodium, I'm sorry, ethanol dissolved in water, okay, so the water molecules have broken the part the ethanol molecules, and I've got another type of solution, a gold wedding band, um, and a gold wedding band is actually a mixture of silver and gold that kind of helps it protect its strength and different things like that, so it's actually a mixture, if you ever have jewelry, it's typically a mixture of several different things, and that is a solid solution, and an example of a gaseous solution would be the air that we're breathing right now in this room. That is a gaseous solution. Uh, solute, solvent, remember the solute is the one that is getting dissolved. Solvent is the one that's doing the dissolving. Uh, an example of a gas-gas solution is oxygen and nitrogen. There's more nitrogen than oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, a gas-liquid situation would be like carbon dioxide in water. A liquid-liquid solution is alcohol in water. A liquid-solid solution is um, mercury and silver uh, and tin, which is a dental, what they used to fill dental cavities with. Um, a solid-liquid uh, solid-solvent combination could be sugar in water or salt in water, something like that. And a solid-solid Solute solvent is like copper in nickel or nickel in titanium, which is a lot of what they use um, in different alloys that we, we've come to know and appreciate today. Brass is another type of solid solid. Uh, copper and several different metals coming together to make a brass um, solution for several things that we use, typically decorative items. A suspension is if the particles in a solvent are so large that they cannot, that they settle out, so large that they settle out unless the mixture is constantly stirred or agitated. All right, think of a muddy water, okay? If you leave that muddy water sitting long enough, eventually all that mud's going to settle to the bottom and you'll get some semi-clear um, liquid at the top. Okay, so that's a suspension. Then when you shake it back up, all that mud, debris, and different things goes back within the liquid, and after time again, it will uh, settle out. A colloid is a particle, particles that are intermediate in size between those in solutions and suspension for mixtures are known as colloidal dispersions. Okay, colloidal dispersions. Now, um, there are several different colloids that we come into existence with every day. If we have a solid colloid, or that's solids dispersed in liquids, examples of that are going to be paint and mud. I mean, that's why mud semi-flows, because it's got all that uh, soil dissolved in the water. Paints are simply 
um, pigments typically with transition metals uh, made of transition metals that are suspended in some liquid medium. A gel is a solid network extending throughout the liquid. Think of a gelatin or um, think of your toothpaste if you're using a gel toothpaste. A liquid emulsion, a homogenized milk is an example of a liquefied emulsion. emulsion. A mayonnaise is also, is also a liquid uh, emulsion. If you were to mix the ingredients for either milk or mayonnaise separately, they would separate. Think of oil and water. As a matter of fact, that's, that's really what you're seeing here. Um, oil and in water. But the way that they come together, or are, they are emulsified, they tend to maintain their solid um, properties. Another example of a colloid is a foam. Think of shaving cream or whipped cream. That is some type of either soap, if you're dealing with a shaving cream, or uh, sweet, um, sugary goodness, if you're dealing with whipped cream, that is suspended, or that has air suspended in it. Um, a solid aerosol, smoke, um, auto exhaust, smog is a solid aerosol. A liquid aerosol would include um, fog or mist, clouds or aerosol spray. And a solid emulsion is a liquid dispersed within a solid, and an example of that would be cheese or butter. Um, another example of a colloid is a marshmallow where you've got those um, air molecules that are surrounded by that sugary goodness of a um, marshmallow. Alright, another thing that we need to talk about is the Tyndall effect that you just kind of need to be aware of. The Tyndall effect occurs when light is scattered by colloidal particles in a transparent medium. Alright, we have a um, flashlight shining in through both of these gas collection jars. Okay, and what happens is you notice that this one will start to go straight through, but when it hits this second jar, the light starts to deflect and go off in various regions. What's actually happening? Well, the light is hitting the particles in the solution or in this um, colloidal suspension, and it's being deflected, kind of like a little bitty mirrors that are being all throughout there, and it's deflecting the light that's occurring. All right, so let's actually talk about the process of solvation. Solvation is the process of dissolving. Okay, in the process of solvation, the first thing that must happen is the solute particles are surrounded by solvent particles. Okay, solute particles are surrounded by solvent particles. That means you typically have some solid, and or that's the way we typically think about it, and a liquid is going to come and surround it. Think about having a beaker of salt, table salt, in ACL, and pouring water in it. That's the first thing that's going to happen. It's going to surround that sodium chloride. The second thing, or the next thing that's going to happen, the particles are then going to be separated by some uh, intermolecular force. Either the hydrogen molecules are going to separate, the oxygen molecules, or what have you. Positives and negatives are going to play into the solvation process. Now, in the process of solvation, we have three types of compounds that we typically like to talk about. Non-electrolytes, electrolytes, and strong electrolytes. Well, first of all, let's remember what an electrolyte is. An electrolyte is something that has the ability to pass an electric current. Now, in order for something to be an electrolyte, we typically say that it needs to um, have a charge, okay, or some partial charge, or it needs to be polar, okay. An example of a non-electrolyte is where the, solutes ex uh, the solute exists as molecules only. For example, sugar is a non-electrolyte because it is not polar, it doesn't have a charge. Okay, if you need to review polarity, go back to chapter uh, 6 lectures. Weak electrolytes, solute exists as ions and molecules, as in acetic acid. Well, what happens, what's the formula for acetic acid? H, C2, H3, O2. What happens is that hydrogen molecule comes off uh, of that acetate ion and they're existing separately inside of this compound. Okay, The hydrogen and the acetate will pass the electric current though it's not very good at it because that acetate so long and tends to be uh, fairly non, it's not that it's completely nonpolar but it just doesn't pass the charge well because it's so large. Now a strong electrolyte is where the solute exists as ions only, either through dissociation or ionization. That means that the compounds completely break apart and that they are passing an electric current with these 
uh, charges. Okay, we've talked a lot about charge in the past uh, year. Now, dissociation, let's talk a little bit about dissociation. Dissociation is the separation of an ionic solid, right here we have an example of sodium chloride, into aqueous ions. What happens is the um, water molecules are polar. They have a negative oxygen in and partially positive uh, hydrogen ends. The partially positive hydrogen ends come in and hook up with the negatively charged chlorine atoms and the partially uh, positive end or the oxygen end comes in and hooks up with the um, the partially negative charged oxygen end comes in and hooks up with the partially positive charged sodium end. What ends up happening is that it breaks apart. Okay, and I'm gonna I show I'm gonna show you a video in class of that. Uh, if you don't remember that, the link to that video will be with these lectures. Now, the second process of ionization or, or a solvation is ionization. In ionization, you have breaking apart of some polar molecules into aqueous ions. So we have water and nitric acid. What happens is this water being having a partially negative charge with these two lone pairs of electrons will come in and steal this extra hydrogen away from the nitric acid. Okay? And you end up with H3O which is referred to as the hydronium ion which we'll talk a little bit more about when we get to acids and bases and you end up with the nitrate anion. Okay? Notice the phase changes in both of these examples. You've got a solid then you're adding water. Remember, A cubed means dissolved in water. Okay, take nitric acid, dissolve it in water, and then you end up with uh, H3O-NO3. Now, molecular solvation, or the process of dissolving a molecular compound, the entire molecule stays intact. But what happens is the water molecules surround all of the, um, say we have sugars here, surrounds all the sugars so that they are no longer crystal structure but they are broken apart. How do we express that? Well we have solid sugar and when we add water to it we express it as AQ for aqueous. Now in the process of solvation what will dissolve what? Well we always say we have this mantra in chemistry that like dissolves like. So if you have a nonpolar solute you have to have a nonpolar solvent. Likewise if you have a polar solute you have to have a polar solvent. Again, if you don't remember polarity you need to go back and look at chapter 6 because that's going to play a big role in uh, determining whether your bonds are polar and several things like that. Okay, uh, uh, Kind of a way to clean things or we use soap rather and detergent to clean things. Why is soap so good or how does soap actually work? Well soap has a polar head with a nonpolar tail. That's why it will set up and actually dissolve the grease off of maybe a pot or pan that you've been cooking, if any of you are cleaning. If any of you have ever washed dishes, you will note that you just can't, or it's very hard to get grease off of a pan with just water. Why is that? Well, we know water and grease or water and oil molecules separate. But if you use soap, that soap will actually come in, and since it has a polar head and a nonpolar body, it will break that grease down, making it able to dissolve with that water. Now, let's talk a little bit about solubility. We have three types of solutions that we talk about in terms of solubility, and we'll cover some more a little bit later. We have an unsaturated solution, where typically uh, think of it as weak um, tea, or if you have a Coke and it's watered down. It's not very concentrated. The Coke's not very concentrated in it. We can do the same thing with um, chemicals. We can add more solid until it dissolves. Then we have a saturated solution. That's when no more solid dissolves. We keep adding and adding, and eventually the solid crystals will not break down. Think of that as a Coke that you're drinking at just the right concentration. It's, it tastes good and all that stuff. Now, a supersaturated solution is when your solution becomes so unstable that crystals begin to form. And we're actually going to perform a lab using magnesium sulfate to look at some of these crystals. But think of a really strong Coke that you're drinking at, like McDonald's or somewhere. Um, really, really strong. Uh, and it burns going all the way down. That's because your concentration of the Coke syrup is so high that it's a little bit diff difficult to, uh, or it has so much in there that you can taste it and it's difficult to get down maybe. 
Alright, solubility. Solubility is the maximum grams of solute that will dissolve in 100 grams of solvent at a, at a given temperature. Notice that this varies with temperature and it is based upon a saturated solution. SOLN is my abbreviation for solution. So let's look at a solubility curve. Essentially what that's saying is as you increase temperature, you can increase the grams of solute. Okay, So as you increase temperature, you increase the amount of stuff that you can dissolve. Okay, solids are more soluble at higher temperatures. Okay, think about when you make tea or when you have tea in a restaurant. Um, if you, for some reason, get unsweet tea by accident, it's kind of difficult to make that tea sweet or if they run out of sweet tea. It's difficult to make that tea sweet because once it gets cold, that sugar will not dissolve. But if you have really high temperature tea, it's easier to dissolve that. Uh, gases are more soluble at low temperatures and high pressures. We've talked about that in the previous chapter. We're going to call, or we're not going to call that. That is called Henry's Law. I did not give that a name in the last chapter. Um, I, I put special emphasis on this in the last chapter. And the example of that is nitrogen narcosis, or uh, sometimes referred to as the bends. Um, the higher the pressure, the lower the temperature, the more dissolved gas you're going to have. Think about a Coke as well, or a soda is sometimes referred to a Coke. If you've got a Coke and you unscrew the top and it makes that sound, what happens? Well, typically you see a lot of carbon dioxide rush to the top and you end up with that foam. Well, that's because as you lower the pressure, that carbon dioxide that we like to drink so much, or that we like to, that makes our drinks fizzy rather, um, actually comes to the surface. It comes out of solubility. Now, factors affecting solubility or the rate of dissolution. Surface area. How can we increase how something will dissolve? Well, we increase the surface area. That's why powdered sugar or granulated sugar will dissolve more quickly than, say, a sugar cube. If you've ever had any um, luck with that. Uh, or if you've ever had any contact with a sugar cube. You. Agitation or stirring, rather, will also increase the rate of dissolution. Think about if you're at the restaurant and you run out of, uh, if, if the tea is not sweet enough, you put a packet of sugar in there, you try to stir it to get all those sugar molecules that have collected, or those sugar crystals that have collected down at the bottom to dissolve. Temperature will also increase the temperature, uh, or increase the temperature, also increase the rate of dissolution. If you increase the temperature, if you warm it up, more and more will dissolve. And that's kind of a really brief, really quick intro to solubility and solutions.